Hello YouTube. Bane666 here. Welcome to Propaganda of Toxic Feminism. The series in which I expose and debunk falsehoods, misconceptions, and outright lies spread about the men's rights movement. So let's get stuck into it. Well, I had wanted to finish off the James Fell article last episode, but I ended up spending much more time than I had intended, on the gender sentencing gap. Not that I regret it, as it was very important information. But it does mean that I still have half the bullshit spouted by James Fell to shovel. As no doubt you'll painfully remember, the first half of his article was just one big long sex shaming ad hom attack where he basically claimed that MRAs wanted to go back to the good old days of the 50s so we could rape our wives whenever we want. Because, you know, apparently we are all such losers, that rape is the only way we can get laid. Or some shit like that. And if you haven't seen last episode, and think this is hyperbole on my behalf, then I urge you to go watch it, or to read James' article, link below, and see for yourself. But we are now up to the part in Mr. Fell's article, where he actually starts to put forward his evidence. This is going to be interesting. What is my evidence of MRA being a bunch of losers? Here is but a small sample. Paul Elam is the most identifiable leader of MRA, and this expose tells the tale of a man who was a deadbeat dad, lousy provider, racist, drug and alcohol abuser, who, when his wife was raped, said that she was asking for it. Since then he had a number of failed relationships, and has had a habit of living off women. Feel free to read the entire piece to learn about the ghastly positions this man has taken in regards to women and feminism as the leader of the website A Voice for Men, which is supposed to be the more moderate voice of MRA, and is a centerpiece website of the movement. Okay, so James' first piece of evidence is a hit piece from BuzzFeed called, how men's rights leader Paul Elam turned being a deadbeat dad into a money-making movement. Now, I have to say, that I really hate responding to these, he said, she said, type of articles. I really prefer to deal with facts that I can verify. And this entire article is based on the word of Paul's ex-wife and estranged daughter, well possible daughter. And to understand what I mean by that, I suggest you read both the BuzzFeed article as well as Paul's own response. Links below. But the point is, I don't know Paul Elam personally, I've never met him, I've never chatted to him, and I don't know who he was 30 years ago. The same can be said for his ex-wife and possible daughter. I've never met them, I've never chatted to them, I have no idea who his wife was 30 years ago, I don't even know their real names. So as someone who values the truth, how exactly am I meant to evaluate this? Paul's ex-wife could be telling the truth, or Paul could be telling the truth, or most likely, the truth lays somewhere in the middle. Either way, short of moving to Texas, and hiring a team of private eyes, I have no way of knowing. And neither does James Fell. So I'm just going to suggest that you all read both articles, and make up your own minds which will probably mean that those of you who lean more towards men's rights will believe Paul, and those of you who lean more towards feminism will believe his ex. Which is why I hate these types of stories. There are a couple of other points I should make though, about this type of article. The first is that, the events that reportedly took place in the article, happened 20 to 30 years ago, and it's very possible that even if all these events are true, as reported, that Paul could have changed since then. In fact both articles support this. For example ELM says in his article. She also alleges I had a drug and alcohol problem. There is some truth to that, though no more at all a problem than she herself had, including drinking and smoking PCP while she was pregnant with her daughter. And BuzzFeed reports. Two months after Bonnie was born, Elam was arrested for violation of Washington's drug laws and illegal fishing, according to state records. A few months later, Susan was pregnant again. Before her son was born, Susan left Elam, who, she said, was drinking and using drugs regularly. Okay, so we can safely say that when Paul was much younger, he had a drug and alcohol problem, 
at least to some degree. But as BuzzFeed also says, after his divorce from Susan, Elam became a successful drug and alcohol addiction counselor. He said he was the clinical director of three substance abuse recovery programs as well as a private contractor. But by around 1999, Elam said he quit to be a truck driver. He had also been married and divorced two more times. Now, based on these scraps of information, it sounds to me like Paul turned his life around. Once again, I don't personally know any of the people involved in this drama, and I'm only relying on their testimony, but I do think this illustrates that someone can change in 30 years. Now, does that necessarily mean Paul has changed? No, maybe he was an arsehole back then, and still is today, or maybe he was never an arsehole, or maybe he was, and he changed. I simply don't know. But I have to wonder, should someone be judged solely on their actions from 30 years ago, or in this case, I should say, allegations from 30 years ago? At what point do we judge someone by who they are today, and not by who they might have been when they were much younger? Which brings me to my next point. Should these type of articles be written? To be honest with you, I'm not sure how to answer that. As you all know, I keep my identity private because to be honest many who are in our opposition are lacking a moral compass. And I really don't need personal attacks affecting my life and career, not to mention friends and family. I have nothing to hide, but as we know, our opposition aren't afraid to make shit up. And when enough useful idiots regurgitate it, it somehow becomes fact on the internet. Need I mention that many people still believe Elliot Roger was an MRA? I think truth and logic are our greatest weapons in this fight, but to our opposition they are just inconveniences to be ignored. Besides, my arguments should stand or fail based on their merit, right? It shouldn't matter who's making them. And in the vast majority of cases, I would agree, but there are some exceptions. For example, normally I'm of the opinion that a person's sexuality is their own business, and no one else's. In other words, what consenting adults do in the privacy of their own bedrooms, is none of my business, and in no way should be relevant to the quality of their argument. It shouldn't matter if they are gay, straight, bi, celibate, or a slut. And for the record, I'm using the word slut in the positive manner that the slut walkers have indoctrinated me into. So someone's sexuality shouldn't matter, just their argument. But, let me give you a scenario. Imagine for a moment that there is a right-wing, fundamentalist, anti-gay, preacher. He makes his living by preaching the evils of homosexuality. But he's suddenly found naked in a motel room bed with two 18-year-old men. I mean, maybe they all just got caught in the rain, their clothing got soaked, and they were sharing body heat to keep warm, right? Sure, and if you believe that, I've got a gender studies degree to sell you. So normally, I would say, what happens in someone's bedroom is private and irrelevant, but obviously not in this particular case. Which brings me back to Paul Elam. No he hasn't been found naked in a hotel room bed with two 18-year-old men, although I'm sure BuzzFeed is probably working on that article right now, never let the facts get in the way, right? But I have to wonder, if Paul is speaking out about father's rights, then doesn't that open his past up to scrutiny? Like I said, I'm a bit conflicted with this one. I guess it would be easier to answer if the media was fair and unbiased. Anyway, as always, let me know your thoughts on this below in the comments section. One more thing about the BuzzFeed article before moving on to James' next point. There are a couple of things that we can look at to verify. For example, the men's rights movement, which emerged in the 1970s as a response to second-wave feminism, may still be a fringe phenomenon in the United States, but Elam has revitalized it for the social media age. In 2008, he founded A Voice for Men, now the movement's most popular website, which has birthed the broader online community where aggrieved men swap me mess and commiserate. Swap me mess and commiserate? Really? Let's continue. His work has helped fellow activists attract sympathetic media attention, launch franchises all over the world, and seek mainstream acceptance. 
Some politicians now use the movement's talking points to enforce anti-abortion laws and attract voters who care about fathers' rights. He links to an article by Amanda Marcotte. Her article is called, Missouri Lawmaker Uses, Men's Rights, Talking Points to Justify Abortion Restriction. She starts off this article with a long rant describing the evils of men's rights activism, which includes, Feminism is generally seen as an attempt to set up women, viewed as inferior people, as the power brokers in society and to oppress men, who are seen as the only meaningful contributors to society. Thus the name of the MRA Watch blog We Hunted the Mammoth. With pickup artists, women are characterized as malicious creatures who deliberately deprive worthy men of sex for the lulls. Everything women do that MRAs don't like, be it speaking out about rape or declining to date you, is viewed as done for hateful, malicious reasons. It's all a very adversarial view of men and women. So to sum up her article, MRAs are the children of Hitler and Satan who want to keep the poor Western women oppressed, or something like that. You know the normal shit. They never talk about actual MRA talking points, well, at least not without distorting them, and never with any sympathy or understanding. She then goes to great lengths to tie MRAs to a Missouri Republican, who wants fathers to be able to stop pregnant women from having an abortion. The extent of her evidence, tying the two groups together, is that, in her opinion, they share talking points. For example, but what really matters here is this is a clear-cut case of MRA-style thinking, concocting a paranoid fantasy of a matriarchal government that is oppressing men and using it as a pretext to oppress women, but for real. The sort of thing is cropping up more and more all the time. I suspect there's going to be a collision with the religious right when the contradictions between their ideologies start causing real problems. Man, believing in equality sure is simpler, isn't it? This of course is just another example of the, in my opinion, they sound alike, therefore they must be the same, fallacy. I'm sure there is an actual name for that fallacy, but that one will do for now. So let's play this game, shall we? Beat Bahar Mustafa, she's a racist. She's also a feminist. And we know that the KKK are racists. So therefore, using Amanda Marcotte's level of logic, all feminists must support the KKK in every single belief, and hate blacks and Jews. You should be ashamed of yourselves feminists. But seriously, I think you can all see why this logic is flawed. It renders complex issues to simplistic interpretations, so as to lump different groups in together. And more often than not, this technique uses individuals as spokespeople for the entire movement. And this is exactly what Amanda does in her article. So desperate to blacken our name, she tries to paint us all as right-wing anti-abortion Republicans. Now no doubt, we do have some people in the movement who fit that description, just as we have people who could be classed as the exact opposite, but most of us fall somewhere in the middle. But back to the BuzzFeed article. I see this all the time in this type of article. It will make a claim, and as a citation, it will link to an opinion piece which often as a citation will link to another opinion piece, which as a citation will link to another opinion piece, and so on. It gets to the point where it's person A's opinion, backed by person B's opinion, based on person C's opinion, based on person D's opinion, etc. So I have to ask a simple question. What if just one person in the chain is wrong? What if just one person is lying? What if just one person misreads or misinterprets the previous link? What if everyone in the chain is bias, and that bias is compounded with the creation of every new link in the chain? Welcome to online journalism. Next. The other thing I wanted to point out about the BuzzFeed article, is the mandatory, we hunted the mammoth link. It's seriously hard to find one of these articles without a link or two, or five or ten, back to Dave Futrell's bias rag. Anyway, let's check out James Fell's next claim. The above story also tells of how the AVFM website, which is run by volunteers and is for profit, barely makes any money. As a capital venture, it's a failure. Despite Elam sinking so much time and energy into it, he's not having a lot of success selling his brand of hatred. Well, that's strange. 
because the BuzzFeed article clearly states. What is clear is that Elam has amassed tens of thousands of followers, and lined his pockets with their donations to the for-profit AVFM, which are estimated to be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. When asked how this money is spent, Elam told BuzzFeed News that a voice for men's finances were, none of your fucking business. So let me get this straight. Elam is criticized by BuzzFeed for making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Then James Fell criticizes Elam for barely making any money, and uses the BuzzFeed article as evidence. So apart from the obvious contradiction here, we also have a double standard. It seems Elam is condemned if he does make a profit, and condemned if he doesn't. It would be nice if BuzzFeed and James Fell were to inform us of exactly how much money Paul is, or isn't allowed to make, since it seems they are the moral judges of his financial reality. Not to mention all the feminist sites that are for profit. Do you think maybe Jezebel is making a buck or two? Or Anita Sarkeesian? Or even Dave Futrell? You know, the guy who runs the site that both BuzzFeed and James link to. And to be honest with you, good luck to all of them. As I've said numerous times before, how people spend their own money is their own business. If you want to give it to Scientologists, or New Age hippies, or fundamentalist Christians, or feminists, or MRAs like Paul, and myself, my Patreon link is down below by the way, or the homeless guy on the corner, or an animal shelter, or blow it all at a casino, it's entirely up to you. As long as it's your cash, it's your choice. So I'm not going to judge Paul or anyone else that makes a buck, if he is even making a buck, and not just covering cost. Either way, it's none of my business. And unless James Fell is donating to Paul and AVFM, it's really none of his business either. Next. On the Twitter front, David Futrell did some investigating and discovered that two of the most active MRA Twitter folks, AVFM leaders Dean Ismay and Jack Barnes, had mostly fake Twitter followers, only 26% and 20% respectively, were genuine. I checked my Twitter following using the same tool and discovered that my followers were 88% genuine. Futrell's score was even better at 92%. Is it possible that Ismay and Barnes are losers who have to buy followers to pretend to be popular? Wow. So now we are fighting over who has more Twitter followers? Really? We are supposedly evil misogynistic arseholes that want to turn back time to the 1950s so we can freely rape our wives, but the best he can come up with, is the number of Twitter followers? Really James? So good old James Fell links to We Hunted the Mammoth, why am I not surprised, so let's have a look at the article. Futrell's article is called, Did a Voice for Men's Dina's May and Jack Barnes MRA by Thousands of Fake Twitter Followers? Futrell's article links to an article called, Fake Friends with Real Benefits, which is actually an interesting read, link below. The short version is, a journalist bought thousands of fake Twitter followers over the internet to see how easy it was, the article goes on to say. This is a network graph representation of my Twitter followers after I acquired the bots. The top cluster represents my, real, followers, who are intertwined, many follow each other, clearly a community of users. While the bottom purple region represents the fake accounts, who are completely separate. Structurally they're clearly not a real community, with very little connectivity between the accounts. Interesting, but back to Futrell. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, as, you know, it's the number of fucking followers someone has on Twitter as an argument, and I really hate Twitter, which is why I'm not on it. So let me break this down quickly. Both Futrell and James Fell claim that Dean Ismay and Jack Barnes have a higher percentage of fake followers than themselves. They conclude that Dean and Jack, therefore must have bought these followers. There are a couple of problems with this logic. If we are going to conclude that Dean and Jack have fake followers, and therefore must have bought them, should we not then conclude the same about James Fell and Dave Futrell? And if Futrell's and James Fell's fake followers can be explained alternatively, then why not Dean's and Jack's? Now it is true, that if these figures are correct, then both Dean and Jack have a much higher percentage of fake accounts, is there an explanation for this? Well, 
if fakes are determined by their lack of interconnectivity, then would not SOC accounts, created to hassle someone also show up as fake? I'd be interested to see what percentage Anita Sarkeesian would have. If I understand correctly how the process works, I suspect it might be very high. But the interesting thing is, even if we take Futrell's figures as fact, Dina's May is still more popular than either Futrell or James Fell. Let's hope the next point is a little more interesting. Next. Canadian MRA Dan Perrins recently launched a hunger strike for what Futrell describes as vague and grandiose reasons, and no one cares. People cared when Gandhi went on a hunger strike, because he was a great man loved by millions. But with Perrins people just shake their heads and wonder da fuck his problem is. Gandhi? Really James? Setting the bar a little high there don't you think mate? I cannot think of any feminists off the top of my head who have gone on a hunger strike, although I'm sure there has been more than a few. And obviously they don't count, right James? Because they weren't fucking Gandhi. And yet another link to Futrell. What would James do without man boobs? He might have to think for himself. But Danny Boy is an extremely hard-working and dedicated MRA, who I've been a long-time subscriber to, and he's also been a long-time sub of mine, hello Danny Boy if you are watching. So I think it's only fair to let Danny Boy describe why he went on a hunger strike. How you doing there folks, me and Jeb here. Um, we're by my brother's grave, and uh, I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about the uh, walk that's coming up. Um, the walk is open to everybody. Okay, this is not a time to uh, be uh, arguing our differences. This is a time to be raising a voice that something needs to be done about this. This uh, really, it's it's pretty much an epidemic. Uh, eight men a day in Canada, and we're doing very very little about it. As a matter of fact, absolutely pretty much nothing. Um, we've got you know one week to make our point here that uh, men matter, that you know men are human, and as such uh, deserve you know equal measure of compassion, consideration, care, empathy, and, and uh, you know, consideration and services. Um, perhaps not services that are uh, the same, that are geared towards women, but different services, I would, I would say. Um, so everybody's, you know, uh, I'm inviting everybody to come out and walk. Um, the point of this walk is to raise awareness. Um, like I said, uh, you know, this is an open invite for Hamilton police to uh, walk a mile in his boots. Um, I'm inviting you to, you know, send out the mounted unit for a mile or so. I'll be walking by, I intend to walk by Central Police Station and uh, put a sticker up. I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss and, uh, you know, my deepest profound condolences to uh, Hamilton Police Services and um, the family. Um, yes, um, this is where my story begins. Um, and my experiences begin with uh, suicide. Um, on a nasty, nasty morning uh, in 1982, on May 8th, 1982, I remember waking it uh, to the sound of the phone ringing. I remember it was like yesterday. It was, it was, uh, it, it put an indelible mark in my life, this situation. Um, so the phone was ringing. I heard it. Nobody got it. Um, the, uh, they called back, and I, uh, the next thing I heard was uh, the most, uh, God awful scream from my mother. Um, it was uh, it was a call uh, telling her that you know her firstborn son had uh, committed suicide. Um, so uh, Hamilton Police Services and my family, I I, I understand uh, all too well um, the pain that you're going through. And again, you have my uh, deepest, most profound condolences on that. We've argued in the past on things, but. Uh, May 4th to 10th is not the time to argue. It's the time to say, hey, enough's enough. We need to do something about this. After after May 10th, after this week, let's let's argue passionately again. But for the for the week of May 4th to 10th, let's put aside our differences. Let's stop the arguing. Let's do something about this situation. Every single one of these guys is a mother, father, brother, sister, aunts, uncles. They got family, they got communities, and their deaths just rip the souls from them. So on May 4th to 10th, 
join me in my walk from Dundas to Toronto, Queen's Park, Toronto. Raise our voice. We need to stop the silence, guys. Saying, not telling people I need a hand. I need a hand up, not a hand out. We need to end that silence. Now I've chosen to walk for Canadian Association for Equality, an organization that I know does good work for men and their families. And I want to see them grow, and they will grow if you help them. So if you're going to donate some money, donate it to them. I'm also going to give a shout out to Mo no, uh, Movember. They donated last year $12 million towards men's mental health. That's more than the federal government has put in in at least the five years, possibly even ten years. I've had enough of Anthony's. I, I've had enough of them. I've had enough of Earl Silverman's. It's time to end this shit. So after completing a 77-mile walk to bring awareness to the serious issue of male suicide, Dan tried to deliver demands to the Queen's Park Legislative Assembly that men's issues like suicide and domestic violence shelters get equal government attention. Initially they refused to even accept his demands for review. Dan started his hunger strike soon after in Queen's Park to help bring awareness to the government's lack of interest in important male issues. Uh, started out, uh, well it's Mental Health Week in Canada here, nationally. And uh, this year's theme is uh, Mental Health for Men. Now men make up 76% of all suicides in Canada, but there are two disturbing peaks. One at 20 years old and one at 50, around 50 years old. At those peaks, they make up 80% of the suicide population. They, uh, so we are, in essence, we are burying our sons and our fathers at a rate of about eight a day across Canada. In Ontario, we have 39% of the population, so that translates to about three male suicides a day in Ontario alone. So every eight hours, a family, a community, a workplace, has a hole ripped into the soul of that community due to a male suicide. I'm here to stop that. Shameful how we treat our, our half the human race in Canada. I'm here to protest that, and I've issued them a bit of a uh, some terms. I'm asking that full uh, full funding for male male, male uh, domestic abuse shelters. What a shame that the online media was more interested in spreading false rumors about MRAs boycotting Mad Max than actually putting the spotlight on a serious male issue. What a shame that the feminist community which claims to care about the issues of men, were more interested in demonizing Danny Boy than actually supporting him. Well, I for one have even more respect for you after this mate, keep up the great work Dan, you are an inspiration to us all. Next. A voice for men has a regular contributor who is a Holocaust denier and fan of Hitler, this is the kind of guy the movement attracts. Once again James Fell targets a voice for men. And once again his evidence consists of an article by Dave Futrell. I'm noticing a pattern here. So the Futrell article talks about an Indian MRA by the name of Amartya Talukdar, who it seems has written a total of five articles for AVFM, between December 2014, and May 2015. So on average less than one a month. According to Man Boobs Futrell, Amartya Talukdar tweeted, Holocaust is a product of allied propaganda just like Saddam's weapon of mass destruction. And Futrell has the screen capture to prove it. So, yeah, I hate to say it, but I'm going to have to side with Dave Futrell on this one, something you won't hear me saying too often. But looking at the evidence here, he's right, and I'm not going to deny it. Still, this is the views of one individual, Suggesting that the men's rights movement is somehow a magnet to Holocaust deniers is ludicrous. Next. In the recent UK election Mike Buchanan ran on a men's rights platform and came a very distant last with only 153 votes, the winner got 19,448 votes, showing just how much the vast majority of people don't like these guys. Wow, an actual point that has nothing to do with AVFM, and isn't backed up by an We Hunted the Mammoth article. I'm actually shocked. Anyway let's deal with this claim. So James claims that we are all losers because Mike Buchanan ran last, and this shows how the vast majority of people don't like us. Actually James, if I was to nitpick, I'd point out that technically, it only shows that Mike Buchanan's electorate doesn't like, or possibly understands, 
Mike Buchanan. But I have to wonder, how would James react if a feminist running in an election ran last? What if Hillary ran last in the next American election? Would that be evidence, I wonder, that all feminists are whiny fucking losers? Or would James see it as some form of patriarchal oppression and misogyny? Could it be James, maybe, just maybe, Mike Buchanan ran last because society prioritizes the issues of women, and doesn't give a shit about males? You know, kind of like what we just saw with Danny Boy. Or might it be that feminism has such an influence in the media, that our message is constantly distorted, corrupted, or silenced? That is of course when we are not being lied about, you know, like in James' own article. Next. In the most recent move of epic loserdom, MRAs are boycotting the critically acclaimed Mad Max, Fury Road movie because, I don't know, Charlize Theron is tough, or something. It goes on and on. Okay, so here James once more regurgitates the lie that has been perpetuated throughout the media. I've already debunked this in a previous video. But here's the short version in case you missed it. A non-MRA named Aaron Clary, wrote his own opinion in an article on a pickup artist site. So no, MRAs are not boycotting Mad Max. Of course this didn't stop dishonest journalists reporting otherwise. Everywhere. Constantly. What a shame they couldn't give the same amount of time and attention to actual serious men's issues. Wouldn't that have been something? Next. Visit David Futrell's We Hunted the Mammoth for years worth of examples of how pathetic the members of MRA truly are. While feminism has its extremist elements, for MRA extremism and promotion of violence against women is the norm and happens at the highest levels, which is why the Southern Poverty Law Center keeps many of the most popular MRA sites on a hate watch. Does James fell owe Dave Futrell money or something? I mean, what would James do without Dave? He might actually have to do some real research, possibly check sources and facts, maybe even form his own opinions. But I guess all that stuff is too hard for James, and it's much easier just to be spoon-fed bullshit. Next. I have mentioned in the past that there are some real issues faced by men worthy of acting upon. But MRAs aren't doing shit about them. Oh the irony, not five minutes ago James was attacking Danny Boy for doing exactly that. Absolutely amazing. Next. When they're not lying with statistics they're latching on to such issues and acting the martyr as an excuse to spread anti-women hatred. Wow, that actually sounds like the perfect description of feminism. Next. For most MRAs, the primary talking points affect them not at all. 19-year-olds pretending to be indignant over parental rights and alimony is hilarious whereas those who have no affiliation with service pretending to care about combat death percentages and PTSD rates for no other reason than to promote misogyny is just offensive. Wow, the idiocy is just off the charts. Firstly, not all MRAs are 19, and many have children, therefore parental rights is a real issue to them. But even if an MRA is only 19, and yet to have children, don't you think he may want to one day? My god James is an idiot. As for his claim that only those associated with military service should give a shit about combat deaths or PTSD, wow, just amazing. I'm guessing then, using the same logic, only those who have been raped should give a shit about rape victims, right? Next. MRAs laughably claim to be for equality as members of a gender with an institutionalized upper hand, a fact they dispute in the most comical of ways institutional upper hand? Which is why Danny Boy had to go on the hunger strike to try to bring awareness to the male suicide issue, and Mike Buchanan ran last, right? Because we are the ones with the institutional power. Unbelievable. Next. For MRA the issues are nothing more than ammunition they've either twisted or appropriated in order to complain about the fact that the world doesn't appreciate a loser. And so, they blame feminism for why their lives suck. They seem to be blind to the fact that why things suck for them is simple, they're losers, and they're not willing to do anything to stop being losers. Not sucking is hard. Complaining is easy. And that's why we have whiny. Fucking. Losers. That's why we don't really have MRAs, 
we have WFLs. James reminds me of a schoolyard bully, who calls other kids names, because it's the only way he can feel good about himself, is by bringing others down. Clearly James should stick to his fitness stuff, after all, running is a lot easier than thinking, at least for James. The close as James comes to that, is personal attacks and regurgitating chunks of man boobs articles. Let's just hope he never runs for government. But I'm not done with James yet, it seems someone sent him my last video, and he wasn't happy. So it seems that James has replied to my video, on Facebook. Let's have a look. Apparently this video is mostly about why I suck. It's like an hour long. Anyone want to watch it for me and give the Coles notes? I kind of find this funny, as James' entire article is about how we suck, I was just responding to his claims. And then James posted this. I'm 98% sure this is the guy who made this video. Then James goes on to say, I did some other digging in the locations, Queensland, Australia line up. Gamer on both profiles too. Others jumped in with. I live in Queensland, in a town 950 kilometers away from Athol. Seeing as the population of Athol is only 277, I'm guessing there's not a lot to do there to keep him busy. And then there is this. An asshole from Athol. Isn't James funny? Others go on to say. I tried. For about six minutes. Why wow, why wow, I don't understand sarcasm why wow, why wow, I've never been laid obviously because of Femi Nazis. Wah wow, wah wow, I'm too scared to show my face or use my real voice wah wow, wah. Wow. You can understand why she is a fan of James. They have exactly the same writing style. Next. I couldn't even get three minutes into it. But we already know what it says. James fell is beta mangina blah blah blah, followed by lots of quote mining and ass facts. I think this comment is fantastic, because it sums up our opposition far better than I ever could. I mean why bother watching something, when you can just imagine what someone might say, right? And as you all know, I never used the words mangina, or beta, to describe James, I actually think he is far more toxic than that. I also don't quote mine, as I've now gone through his entire article, complete with screenshots and links. And I guess any facts that don't agree with the feminist hive mind are ass facts, right? So this is what we are facing folks. An opposition that cannot be bothered listening to us, because they are only interested in fighting straw men. Next. Who has time to make this shit? I wonder if anyone has actually watched the entire clip. Probably more people than those who have read James' article. Next. You're an Illuminati reptilian apparently and our testosterone levels are in danger. Don't you just love straw fedoras? Next. 1. This is amazing. 2. I won't feel successful in life until a hater dedicates an hour-long video to hating me. 3. This guy needs to get out of his mom's basement more. Actually. Only around 16 minutes was about James, most of the episode was about the gender sentencing gap, but I guess you'd have to actually watch it to know that. Next. Got almost 3 minutes in, man I wish I had that kind of spare time. He made an hour long video about hating you? Nice. Next. Wow. I couldn't get past the first 10 minutes of that video. If you are going to attack someone at least have the guts to use your own face and voice. I found it hard not to chuckle. Next. Nothing says, I am a confident man, like completely hiding your identity behind a red skull and a computer voice. I find it interesting, that these people are acting like James was just minding his own business, having never said a bad word about anyone, when all of a sudden the big bad MRAs, or at least one of them, decided to come along and kick sand in his face, for no reason. They actually seem oblivious to the fact that his article, which I was responding to, was nothing but hate, and that it was an attack on us. But I guess it doesn't count when their side does it. It's for me being a coward for hiding my identity. Well I think James has demonstrated why I do that. 
instead of actually taking the time to watch my video and listen to my arguments, he spent his time trying to hunt me down to try to find something about my character to attack. Now some of you may be wondering, is this me? Many of you probably have already figured it out. You see, I make no secret that I come from, and live in, Melbourne. I've never actually been to Queensland. So sorry James, you have shown your ineptitude to actually do research, once again. This guy is not me. Yes, believe it or not, there is more than one Bane 666 out there. I just hope this poor guy isn't hassled too much by James' moronic followers. One of the advantages of keeping my identity private, is it makes it hard for individuals like James to attack you personally. All they have left are my arguments. Of course if they don't have an identity to attack, they will try to project one. But that just gives me more to expose. I have to ask the question, if James found out the real name and address of the Queensland Bane, would he dox him? It wouldn't surprise me at all if the answer was yes. And for the record, I did ask James if he was trying to dox me, but to date, he hasn't answered. Next. Up next we have the ironically titled article, A Male Rape Charity Has Had Its Funding Slashed to Zero. Where are all the outraged men? A vital service for men who have been affected by sexual abuse has lost funding, and yet so-called men's rights activists are still more interested in bringing feminists down. And I say ironically title, because the author has clearly written this article not to spread awareness of the need for men's shelters, but to attack MRAs. However, she does start out on the right track. Survivors UK is a UK charity with over 20 years of experience in listening and helping male survivors of rape and sexual abuse. The charity offers both individual counseling and group therapy services for victims and they provide training to professionals and organizations working with male rape survivors. Recent government statistics estimate that 75,000 men are victims of sexual assault or attempted assault and 9,000 men are victims of rape or attempted rape every year. Yet, despite the figures, dangerous stereotypes still persist that men can't get raped and we can't seem to break the taboo around the subject. I'm guessing the figure she presents would be considerably higher if they were to take into account forced envelopment. But more on that later. Not to mention prison rape. Next. Survivors UK are trying to change that. In 2014, in London, 307 men reported being raped to the Metropolitan Police an increase of 120% from the 2012 figures. In July last year, after a review of victim services in London, it was made one of the four priority areas for the mayor to remedy with the application of the £15 million funding in his control to improve services for victims. In 2015, in London, Survivors UK's funding has been slashed to nothing. I am outraged and we all should be. Survivors UK run a vital service for men who have been affected by sexual abuse and if it shuts, this will affect countless men in London. But perhaps what makes me angrier is that so few men and men's rights activists, more commonly known as MRAs online, have condemned this. I'm always being told that feminists don't give a shit about issues like male rape or suicide. In fact, our detractors contend, feminists don't give a shit about men. In case you missed the memo, feminists hate men. At least that's the impression that we get from anti-feminist men and MRAs, mostly active on the web where they moan about men being oppressed because obviously, being a man is so hard these days. Wow, that last sentence says it all doesn't it? After spending three paragraphs talking about male rape victims not being believed, and not getting help, and now having what little funding was available cut to zero. She shows her true colors by saying, because obviously, being a man is so hard these days. Yes, that's right, because being a man is such a privilege, that no one, not government, and not the vast majority of society, gives a shit about your problems. Well feminists, if that's what you think male privilege is, you are welcome to it. Next. Yes, there are issues that predominantly affect men like homelessness and suicide 
but surely it's a no-brainer that both men and women suffer in our patriarchal society, one that prizes masculinity and expects only three things of women, to get married, get fucked and have babies. Wow. Yes it prizes masculinity so much, that it doesn't give a shit about male victims. Plenty of charities to help female victims though. Strange that. Next. However, Paul Elam, the founder of A Voice for Men, disagrees and told the Huffington Post that, the problem we see is a culture that puts women first in so many ways and men last. Which is exactly what this article proves. How can she not see the lack of services for men, which she clearly stated, as proof that Paul is right. Next. Men's Rights Canada launched their controversial, Don't Be That Girl, campaign, which said that women often make false rape accusations because they feel guilty for having one-night stands. Which was a response to the Don't Be That Guy campaign, which strangely, ignored female rapists. Next. And on Return of Kings, when commenting on the statistic that 90% of women know the perpetrators in rape cases, a contributor wrote that, a man looking to rape someone would not pick a target who could identify him to the police. Oh look, the mandatory Return of Kings article. Now all we need is a citation from Dave Futrell. I've said it a thousand times before, and I'm sick of saying it. Return of Kings is not a men's rights site, it's a pickup artist site. Swapping tips on how to get laid is not a fucking men's rights issue. Next. The focus from men's rights activists seems to be on false rape accusations by women, which are far and few, rather than helping male victims of sexual violence. Okay, dear viewer, let me ask you a couple of simple questions. Imagine a guy and a girl are out drinking, and eventually stagger back to her dorm room. She then passes out from drinking too much, and he has sex with her. Is it rape? I imagine every one of you said yes as having sex with an unconscious person is rape. Okay, imagine for a moment that it wasn't penetrative sex, but instead he just performed oral on her, while she was passed out. Is it still rape? I imagine every one of you said yes, although some of you may be pointing out that technically it's sexual assault, as it didn't involve penetration. Either way, I think we all would agree that it's wrong, as, if someone has passed out, they are incapable of giving consent. One last question. What if we reverse the genders? Megan, in 2012, after a night of drinking, a former student who is now using the anonymous name John Doe accompanied his girlfriend's roommate back to her dorm room, and while John Doe claimed he was blacked out, the accuser admitted performing a sex act on him. 21 months later, she accused him of sexual assault. The school said his account of being blacked out was credible, but still ruled against him and expelled him. John Doe then got a lawyer who discovered text messages that prove he did not initiate the sexual encounter, including a message the accuser sent to a girlfriend admitting she did something really stupid and said her roommate would never forgive her, writing, quote, it's pretty obvi I wasn't an innocent bystander. She also acknowledged John Doe was intoxicated to the point of incoherence, telling her friend that he was, quote, too drunk to make a good lie out of blank. The accuser told the college that after the sexual assault, she invited another male friend over because she felt alone and confused. Yet she had earlier texted the other male friend, writing, quoting again, I mean, I have my room to myself this weekend if you wanted to come over and entertain me. She then admitted to a female friend she had sex with the second man after she had sex with John Doe. The texts were given to Amherst, but the school would not reopen the case. It's unclear why she want, waited 21 months to file the allegation, but in those nearly two years, the accuser lost most of her original friends, including her roommate, and the lawyer for John Doe says her new friends all happen to be victims' advocates. Amherst now says it's confident the process followed is consistent with federal requirements. Can you kind of now understand why we are concerned about false allegations? Innocent until proven guilty has been replaced with guilty if proven male. Next. The reality is that MRAs are a group of misogynists who spend their time on the internet saying things that simply aren't true or attacking women. The Southern Poverty Law Center describes their activism as dedicated to savaging feminists and in particular, women. MRAs do not really care about men. 
Tell that to Danny Boy. Next. They resent feminists not only because their campaign to get rid of Page 3 denied them their daily wank at the breakfast table, but also because every step forward in achieving gender equality, where women are not a subclass of fuckable objects, is a disadvantage in their eyes. And sadly, their resentment towards the fight for the liberation for women does not actually make any difference to the men they are trying to help. I'm sure the men who genuinely believe in gender equality must be fed up with their rhetoric that the reason why men are suffering is because of women. Isn't it interesting how quickly she went from talking about the men's shelter closing down to feminist dogma? Why, it's almost like she only ever brought it up to attack MRAs in the first place. And who has a wank at the breakfast table? Seriously? Next. For instance, on the rights of man, Skimmington writes that all women shortlists for political selections mean that men are banned in Labour's case from standing for Parliament solely because they are men. I guess I didn't notice the men who are MPs for the Labour Party. Paul Elam once wrote on, A Voice for Men, that drunk women were, freaking begging to be raped. And of course, the same old Paul Elam quote that always gets pulled out, which in essence is no different from what feminist Camille Paglia has said in the past that is in its actual context. Next. It seems that if men and MRAs aren't writing, and let's be honest, complete bullshit, they are attacking women. Men's rights activist and founder of Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them, Mike Buchanan, has accused the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project, Laura Bates of lying because she talks about sexism and the disproportionate effects it has on women compared to men. He also gives out, awards, to feminists for lying. Men on the internet can send the feminist campaigner, Caroline Criado Perez online abuse detailing how they want to kill, mutilate and rape her, interspersed with complaints about the inequalities that men face and how men are neglected. But do we see them taking any action? Taking action? Maybe you should ask Danny Boy. Note also that she refers to, men on the internet sending death threats, not MRAs on the internet. Obviously not all men are MRAs, and she knows that she has no evidence that any of those threats were sent by MRAs. So instead she uses the blanket term, men, and the reader then associates this with MRAs. And of course, she ignores online abuse by females, typical. Next. Since the funding for Survivors UK was cut, Michael May started a petition calling for proper funding for men's services. Since he started it, another one was initiated by Andy Keane asking that the Diversity and Equalities Officer of Goldsmiths University be sacked. Bahar Mustafa created an event and asked that men did not attend because she wanted to create a safe space for black and minority ethnic women. That petition had over 23,700 signatories compared with the just over 3,900 signatories of the Survivors UK. It's hard not to draw conclusions about the relative weight given to these two issues from this. Oh, were only MRAs allowed to sign these petitions? Considering our author, June Eric Adori, told us earlier how much feminists really do care about men and our issues, I would have thought they'd be signing Michael May's petition by the truckload. Or it could be that online media has given more attention to Bahar Mustafa which once again comes back to the point that men's issues are ignored, not by MRAs, but by society in general. Next. The idea that the world doesn't revolve around men's needs is inconceivable for MRAs, and that is why they try and get women to shut up, painting misogyny as the righteous option in the process. This is ironic. You see our poor oppressed female author, June Eric Adori, is only 16 yet has written for Cosmopolitan and The New Statesman among others. Isn't it terrible the way she is silenced? Poor oppressed thing. Not to mention she starts the sentence with, the idea that the world doesn't revolve around men's needs is inconceivable for MRAs, which is ironic considering this article is about the needs of men being ignored, because they are men. Next. Men's rights activists forget that the feminist fight for equality will benefit us all. As Laura Bates, the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project has says, it's not about men against women but people against prejudice. So, let's look at what happens when only feminists are left to deal with male victims. 
from Investigating Male Sexual Abuse Survivor Agencies, by Martin Sullivan. 1. Perceptions of the Male Victim as a Potential Perpetrator In all three meetings, discussions on the male victim invariably led to discussion on male perpetrators and there were concerns about male clients being at a higher risk of being aggressive, violent and or disclosing sexually abusive behaviors than female clients. This seems to be influenced by two factors. Firstly, with regard to male clients becoming aggressive or violent, I have to admit that reflecting on this after the meetings I felt a bit insulted. I understood where the concern came from and that it was influenced by societal beliefs about men's potential for aggression. However this is a stereotypical view and not based in fact. The services for male victims of violence and it raised concerns for me how such beliefs consciously or unconsciously may adversely affect the engagement and understanding of these clients seeking support for their own victimization. And from the same paper, an extract from a paper written by Carolyn Worth on the development of the male service within Sekasa. Other issues for women's services. How do we deal with male victims who are also perpetrators of sexual assault? or family violence especially if they do not disclose until they have been with the agency for several months. How do we deal with the reports of female offenders? What does it mean for our theoretical framework? How do male workers avoid collusion with male clients? There is an ongoing tension in the field over the amount of discourse on male victim services. Don't you think it's time the government gave us our own services and stopped the politics and victim blaming? If feminists are really for equality, and care about male victims, then they should get behind this idea. I suspect though, all we will hear is silence. Anyway folks, I'm once again out of time, so until next time, don't drink the poison Kool-Aid. My mates were dead jealous of all the new stuff I got. They all thought it was cool. New toys, gadgets, kites, radio control car. I was popular. And then it stopped. I don't know why it stopped. I didn't want the touching to carry on, but I don't know why it stopped. And that bothers me. I suppose he stopped liking me. Sorry to go on. Other people must have had it much worse. I only had to toss him off occasionally and let him do the same to me. He said my mum wouldn't believe me that it was my fault. I must have brought it on somehow. Sometimes I feel people can see it written on my forehead, like I'm a marked man. They can tell what happened, like somehow it must show. People judge, don't they? I read in the papers that if you're abused, then you're more likely to become an abuser yourself. I've got kids now. I pretend I've got a bad back, so I make sure not to pick them up and cuddle them too often. I make excuses not to bath them. I don't mind really, but I do worry if I'm honest that when I wash them down there, it will trigger something in me. Even worse if it stimulated something in them. The last thing I want to do... The last thing I want to do is to hurt them. I can read them stories, though. That's all right, because I can do that from a distance. I must have asked for it somehow. Like I said, I'd never hurt my kids. So I keep a distance. It's just easier.